having 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then 15 minutes questions, okay? Okay, so I'm Ali, this is Tim. Uh, we're going to be talking about intentional communities or communes, uh, as many of ways of calling it. Um, so I got this good description from Wikipedia, which sounds like cheating, but it was the best one we could find. Um, so a commune is a community of people living together, sharing common interests, property, possessions, resources, and in some communes, work and income. Um, in addition to the communal economy, consensus decision making, not hierarchical structures, and even not ecological living have become important core principles. Um, and there's another site called the IC.org, which is basically a huge um, directory of all the intentional communities in the world that have listed themselves. Um, and they call intentional communities um, eco villages, co housing communities, residential land trusts, communes, student courts, etc. Um, so last time, last year in March and April, I went to visit um, a commune called Black Bear Ranch, which is in far northern California, uh, Siskiyou County. Um, and it's uh, an old gold mining town. Uh, they used to have a population of around 3,000 people. Um, and it turned, eventually turned into a ghost town right after the gold rush. And it's tucked away in a valley, and it's about three hours away from the nearest town. Um, it's very, very secluded. Like The road to get there is closed off for like nearly half the year because of snow. So when I was there, I actually had to get a lift to the nearest road and then walk up the mountain for six miles to get there. Um, so it was founded with the, the slogan, Free Land for Free People. And it was basically in the 60s, a bunch of hippies got together and they wanted to try and live in a different way than like the dominant ideology and the way that everyone else was living. And so they went around to um, a lot of famous musicians and people in Hollywood and they just like knocked on the celebrities' doors and they were asking people who were kind of making money off the hippie movement and they were like, hey, you're making money off of people like us, you should support like what we're doing and help us like start this commune. And so it actually worked. Um, and so then they turned into a trust, so lots of different people own the land, so it can never be sold off. Um, so there's not really any particular, they don't have a mission statement, there's not like a main goal that they all kind of uh, drive towards. Um, that never really was one set up, um, even though it's, it's quite old now. Um, so there's a lot of very diverse individuals all living together. Um, and when I was there, there hadn't been people living there longer than about two years. In the 60s, there was people living there for 10 years or so. Um, and those people became like the elders of the commune. And they, they still kind of have a bit of ownership over it because all of them um, collectively own it. And they do make decisions for the commune. Um, and they have, these, they have large guidelines, which is just like no violence and things like that, quite simple things. Um, but also one of their policies is that if someone comes to the commune, you can't, you can't say, oh, go away. Like if, if someone comes up the path, you have to kind of accept them in and like show them hospitality, um, which I found did kind of create some problems along the line because I felt the reason why people had not been living there for um, huge amounts of time was maybe because so many people were coming in and out and the dynamic was changing so much that there wasn't that much stability um, between the people and like there wasn't that much unity and they weren't all there for the, the same reasons. Like some people were there for like uh, retreating from the outside world or creating al an alternative reality. Um, and then some were there for like they wanted to be self-sufficient um, or be closer to nature. Like there's was, there was so many different reasons for people being there. Um, but one reason, like one big collective reason um, that I found between quite a few of them was like trying to recreate a traditional community. So one that is quite close knit and small, and that is the whole thing. Um, so the way that they sustained themselves was mostly by going out and working on farms um, in the mountains. Um, they, they weren't close at all, so they'd have to go out to the road and hitchhike to um, the nearest place. Uh, and they'd often get food um, for working there, like the leftovers on the farms, or they'd get money, or like sometimes for part of the year, people would go off and work for a month and bring money back. Um, 
and they also um, they did have like food stamps and things. Some of the people, so they would go on food runs and just bulk buy um, huge like bags of grains and stuff. Um, these are also just some of the pictures I took there. So like that's that was when it snowed, and those that that's just the uh, surrounding pines and stuff. And this is one of their um, cabins. They're all quite makeshift cabins that they have. Um, they all kind of look like they'd fall apart at any second. Um, but some of them are left over from the gold mining days, and some of them they just put together over like the, the period of being a commune. Um, so in addition to working, they did, they did have quite a big plot of land. It was in between the big national forest. Um, so they weren't actually allowed to hunt because of the laws against like the national forest and you're not allowed to kill things um, on it. Um, but they had like plots of land for vegetable growing, um, fruit growing, nut growing and stuff. And they had chickens, um, goats. Uh, while I was there, the, the goat was actually slaughtered and they had documented it. Well, it's in that picture. Um, and they also had electricity because they had hydroelectric <coughs> generator, a hydroelectric generator that was in a stream going through their garden and it generated all of the electricity they needed. It was just like this one box. Um, and they had electricity for all their light bulbs, uh, they had internet. Um, yeah, it, it produced a lot of electricity. Um, but yeah. So the way that they made decisions was consensus based. Uh, they'd have weekly meetings every Sunday, people who were official members, um, which is after you've lived there for three months and watched from an official member, had to go to the community meeting. And basically, if topics, uh, if people wanted to talk about topics in the week, they'd write it on a big list. And then at the end of the week on the Sunday, there'd be a voluntary mediator and they'd go through the list and people would discuss the topics and what um, they wanted to do about something or if someone had a problem. Um, and yeah, it was it was it worked quite well for them, even though they were quite a diverse group of individuals. Uh, it was still quite amazing how they actually managed to make decisions together. Um, and they still had the guidelines um, made by the elders and stuff. Um, but their everyday, their everyday wasn't very, it wasn't like it wasn't very structured. Everyone just kind of had their own thing going on, and they would come together if they needed to, they were, I mean, people would eat together. They'd have a big conch shell, like the people would blow when uh, dinner was ready. Um, but like people would just have their own projects and they'd kind of do what they wanted for the community and what they felt like fit um, their needs and stuff. Um, but yeah, so that's just a little bit about this commune, but I'm gonna pass it on to Tim now. So all right. Uh, yeah, so a little just personal context, when I was 16 I got my A-levels from France. I couldn't stand no more the uh, situation, uh, the ataraxy of uh, French students pretending that they were doing something with their lives by demonstrating in the streets. So I left and I started traveling. I wanted to see some of the few alternative projects that were happening in Europe. Um, the, actually, the real first place I went was for La Vieille Valette. So I used to live here, I went down. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of stories to say. It was an adventure. Uh, I've never seen such a place. Uh, it changed my life. A lot of anecdotes, but we don't have much time for that. Um, so that's a little bit the, the structure of the village. They installed themselves in a part of a, a land that was considered dangerous. Uh, it was not habitable. So they just squatted it. And um, it represents one very unique style of uh, self-sufficient communities today who are actually not at all self-sufficient, uh, but try to, to be self-managed. It started in 1992, there was a squat in Paris, and um, the squat movement sort of had this little uh, minority inside it that couldn't quite um, stand cities anymore. The urban life didn't suit them. So they decided to go in the countryside, found this village, and just started with no funds to squat it and to rebuild it. Uh, what I say about that is that it's, uh, it follows a little bit my journey, and I tried to do it historically in a way that that's a very... Um, uh, childish, maybe teenage-like reaction to the world. Uh, we were saying it was like uh, escape, it's an escape of the world. Uh, only, it was only individuals who, through an impulsion, could not stand, uh, either could not stand or were outlawed. A few people took shelter there because they were, uh, the police were looking for them. Um, and they were not trying to define the system they were against, they were not trying to uh, fight or to conceptualize, just what they wanted is, uh, as an act of survival, 
to preserve themselves from a system they could not understand and that thought was destroying themselves. Uh, they were working a little bit like all these uh, communists he described, um, opportunistic in the way that everything that was given to them, they took it, they took the help from the state, so they criticized the state, but they take the social help that they, the state gives them. Um, a lot about liberty, everything is about freedom, uh, yet, I mean, it's, uh, it's an enormous mess. Uh, people hit themselves all day long. Uh, about second generation, I said I would talk a little bit about it. I saw a seven-year-old smoke a joint with his father, uh, not scholar, didn't go to school since he was... Uh, uh, a baby. Uh, so I mean, that's uh, I think the best example of an enormous failure of a very authentic uh, project. So then I left and I went to a few other communes and after a few uh, months I fell in Longomai. It's a very different type of thing. Uh, also the, the story of the thing is much more constructive than the, than the squad. Started in 68, so three main actors, Spartacus group in Germany uh, fighting against neo-Nazis, uh, very, very active. I mean, violent. They were weaponized. The uh, neo Nazis in 72, I think, I think, threw grenades in their headquarters. I mean, it was like uh, violent. Uh, another guy, Roland Perrault, he was French, very active in the Sorbonne um, with the 68 uh, sort of uh, youth movement. Uh, he was so active and a little bit extremist that the French um, police was looking for him, so he fled to Austria. Spartacus, a group of students from Spartacus, had also fled to. Austria because they were uh, being sick by the, by, by, the, by the police. And in Austria and in Switzerland, they uh, united with the group Hydro, Hydro 7. Um, a very, very Swiss uh, organization, very well financed. In Swiss, you can uh, get money even though you're not a nationally recognized organization. So one year, they made 5 million francs uh, a year. They had enormous amounts of money um, fighting against the church and the, um, and, and the army. Uh, they disrupted uh, masses very often. They gathered 5,000 people for an anti-military uh, demonstration. And so this sort of group, both because they united themselves uh, with sort of a uh, common inspiration, Charles Fourier, the guy who invented, supposed to have invented the term feminism. So those ideas, anti-militarism, anti-capitalism, gender equality. And they, sought to, they tried to oppose themselves to very um, upcoming groups uh, like Bada in Germany or the Brigate Rosse, the Red Brigades in, in Italy, that were uh, promoting a violent uh, radical action. And they thought that you know, pacifism was a much more uh, efficient way of doing it. So in, in 1973, they go in France in this, um, in this village I, I showed you. And already in 1976, they can expand. They buy villages, a whole amount of land. They, they're enormous. Um, the three names on there are the legal aspects of how they implemented themselves and how they actually shaped French uh, legal systems and uh, this type of um, self-sufficient communities. Uh, oh. uh, okay. yeah. um, so very active. Five communities in France, one in Germany, two in Switzerland, one in Ukraine. How the hell they got there, I have no idea. I tried to ask one thing about this type of place. Uh, they are so radical that they did not accept questions. I got, I got asked to go. Uh, to leave the place because, uh, except for an example, I was asking about where they got their money. It was very rich. They had beautiful installations, but they didn't want to tell me. Uh, they were very, very um, uh, active. 2,000 Chilean immigrants that they uh, that had fled um, uh, Chile because of Pinochet's uh, putsch. They placed them in different communities in Europe, uh, very in solidarity with the Guarani Indians in Paraguay. Uh, they have also cooperated in Costa Rica that is taking importance since it was created. Um, and their goal was, okay, uh, we want to uh, withdraw from the society that we criticize, yet we want to be active. So creation of a radio of an independent agency of information, who today is also taking some importance. And what they were doing is, the thing is, we, it's, it's a network system. They were not that much in, the, 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 um, uh, they couldn't, they chose to come to France because German countries, uh, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, did not accept them. And in France, the police is very, very uh, skeptical of this thing. A lot of women uh, told them they were sects, uh, cults. So they are very, they, they, the, the whole region around hates them. And then, so they are working in a network in cooperation with other places similar to themselves, but they, they're not accepted by the places they're inside. I was working with a guy called Rodrigo Suarez, who came from Argentina, from Buenos Aires, and who was doing a, a thesis on the second generation in those type of places. Uh, it's amazing. They will tell you that uh, big proportions stay and bring up new communities. No, 80% uh, leave and become bankers. Uh, they, 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 they don't like it. They don't stand it because they see, you know, the fight, for instance, against nuclear family. So there was no mothers, there were no fathers, everybody was educating the child, children together. 
children were fucked up because of that. There is nothing that came out positive out of it. Because not only, it is a positive system in other cultures, maybe, but they were not prepared. And the mother's guilt of not knowing really if they were the best mother in the group of known mothers taking care of the children, the guilt of the fathers not to know if they, who were their children, that influenced their, 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 the life of the shy children. It's, it's amazing. There were, were mental cases, like, like yeah, we should go and help those patients. Uh, I had, and one thing as well, um, in, in the 60s, 70s, a lot of French people came there. I saw two French people in this community, and, and it's as big as there's 80 people in the base. It, uh, there's about 250 people in Europe. Uh, no, the French people are not welcome. Uh, it's very Germanic. There is one way of doing it, and not that open. Uh, I felt it. I felt it. Um, so I say yes. It's aggressive self-management. Uh, they're not self-sufficient. They, they, they're much more than the first one we saw. Uh, but they are not totally, and for them that's not what is important. What is important is to be active, to be an activist, and that causes the uh, rejection from the community in which they install themselves. Um, so yeah, and, and they do the effort of studying capitalism and studying and understanding how to fight against it, so they are shaping tools against it. So then the third place. Uh, so I, I, I moved around for a while, and then I finished in Poland because I started to be also very angry with self-sufficient places, both in Spain, in Portugal, in France. Etc. So I went to Poland, and I started working with uh, the Fundacja Banca, um, the foundation for um, social help. Um, it was created by Tomek and Barbara Sadowski in just at the rupture of communism. Tomek Sadowski was very involved in Solidarność. I met a lot of the uh, big actors in Solidarność. Um, and they were two leading psychologists in, the, in their fields, and they managed to uh, one day go in the countryside, squat to the house, because all those houses, delicate houses that the Communist Party had built, they didn't really care for them, and um, a, a few people started to come, all the marginals from the society, they said, we need to help them, and crazy people. They, they, we can say everything about Catholicism, and, in it, but for them, it made them beautiful people. They gave their three-year-old child, the daughter, to a guy who had been 35 years in, uh, in prison. Um, and, and those changed lives of people. Uh, so, so now they, they went to Washington, uh, Obama shaked hands with them, they are recognized to, to, for their action. Uh, they were, at the time, said European, they were European heroes. Um, they pioneered in a lot of things. But, and I really encourage you to, to, to go and investigate. It's a beautiful example of what can be done today. I was a um, European coordinator, so I was coordinating European projects for them. Europe does good things. Uh, that's really, it's, it's hard. It's, the bureaucracy is incredible, but you can do good things. So that's one example, good Chetze, uh, old derelict uh, Kolko's uh, buildings, and that is really taken. It costs nothing to buy that. So with a little bit of help from the public, uh, from the public party, um, so, okay, the, the Hulu of Chelsea, I will not talk too much about it, it's enormous, there's about 65 people. Um, they are totally self-sufficient, but in Poland it's not a surprising thing, you are self-sufficient and that's normal. Mm -hmm. What is important is uh, all those people living there are alcoholics, uh, people coming out of prison, people whose life were destroyed both by communism and by capitalism. They do not believe in politics, they do not believe in a the state, they're just thinking to try to rebuild themselves. So uh, one rule, you do not drink when you are there, and uh, they are united by this addiction. In my show, I, I want just to show a picture of this guy, Zbeszek. Uh, he, uh, I, I had him on the phone a few days ago, and he salutes uh, this, uh, this project that we have here, and asks for a very um, uh, come back to the roots anthropology. He doesn't quite know what it is, and he doesn't quite care. Uh, <laughs> but, but he said it is needed for the people who are doing this, who have the luxury of doing it, to get involved. Um, a few pictures, uh, they are all friends, uh, people good-hearted, they had horrible lives, horrible lives, uh, 20 years in, the, in gutters for some, but, but today they agree <coughs> themselves, they are sober, they go on. This guy actually, uh, he knew a little bit of anthropology, a uh, great guy, died in my, they, they die every, every day uh, because of smoking, of drinking, and that was also one of the very important points, when you know you can die every day because of your past life, you need to make of your life something that transcends the simple uh, timeline of your life. And that's what they did. Those people were teaching to the, 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 the global, the economical community of both their region, of whole Poland, uh, especially that you saw previously, was talking to the European Union. Those people who have their life destroyed, if given the help to become autonomous, they can change very deeply legislation, bureaucracy, uh, economical systems. They are active. 
Uh, and okay, second generation, so those kids, uh, they're, they're not rich, they don't have a PlayStation 2, but they were happy. They had a family in their communities, there was a chief, there was authority. It, it's not a problem. The kids were happy and it was doing a, a very good job. So I, I'm, I'm finishing here. Um, I'm just giving two names. Pierre Rabhi in France, great guy, uh, Stiglaus, I'm advertising French intellectuals. Uh, really great people, very simple, and two simple guys. He went in prison for 30 years, now leading philosopher. He was a um, um, peasant in Algeria. And I just would like to finish by a little note for my dear anthropology. Uh, that's what I say, and I think that's what we say, that it should become a playground, a, a, a laboratory in which academia, this uh, horrible thing we deal with every day, uh, that gathers all millennial uh, ancient intellectual discipline, is given a chance to reroute itself in the existential core of our humanity. We forget that we become, in, we, we love intellectual masturbation, we spend our days doing that. Uh, it is good to stop, and, and, to, and to do that, at least, and to keep in mind that there are some serious issues, and it's not, it is possible to go to India and whatever, but that happens very close. Uh, go and get a berry, you will have things that will prove to you that whatever you need to do, you need to be rooted. And, um, and that also it has a vocation to reinstate and empower the vital process of individuation. Individuals should exist. I mean, it's something that we have lost today. The, the other, in this whole question of identity, individuality is very, very well uh, thought about. But we do not see how we are losing ourselves. And through the study, we are supposed, or anthropology, anything, to rebuild ourselves as individuals to then be, you know, when we were asking uh, Avi and, uh, and Andrea how we can accommodate the discipline to our lives, to our vocation, uh, by rebuilding ourselves, by helping us to be the intellectual uh, domain, becoming empowered individuals. Mm -hmm. And yeah. thank you. <laughs>